Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing valvular heart disease. Okay, so we're now going to discuss the final pathological process in our list of pathological processes that can lead to valvular heart disease, and that is carcinoid heart disease. So carcinoid heart disease is something that you can get as part of the carcinoid syndrome. And the carcinoid syndrome is something that someone with a carcinoid tumour can suffer from. So in order to understand carcinoid heart disease, we need to know something about the carcinoid syndrome. And in order to know something about the carcinoid syndrome, we need to know what a carcinoid tumour is. So the starting point for this discussion is going to be what is a carcinoid tumour? So let me firstly just write down the name here. Carcinoid tumours are what we want to discuss. So what is a carcinoid tumour then? Well, all carcinoid tumours, and there are multiple different types of carcinoid tumours that can be located at different places around the body, all carcinoid tumours are neuroendocrine tumours fundamentally. They are types of neuroendocrine tumours and indeed the set of all carcinoid tumours. So if I draw a little circle here to represent the set of all carcinoid tumours, so imagine that this ring contains every single type of carcinoid tumour, okay? Uh, the set of all carcinoid tumours is contained within the set of all neuroendocrine tumours, so just drawing this on here. Let's let this red circle now represent the set of all neuroendocrine tumours. So, what this diagram is supposed to show you is that all carcinoid tumours are neuroendocrine tumours, but of course not all neuroendocrine tumours are going to be carcinoid tumours. So there is some additional property of the carcinoid tumours that other neuroendocrine tumours that aren't carcinoid tumours don't have. Now, before we come on to that property, let me just make sure everyone knows what is meant by a neuroendocrine tumour. So a neuroendocrine tumour is a tumour that arose originally from a neuroendocrine cell. So I'm assuming you have studied the pathogenesis of tumours before, you're aware of how it's a multi-step process, this microevolutionary process where you gradually produce these more and more strange clones of cells by this gradual accumulation of mutations. So you start with one cell, that undergoes a mutation that maybe allows it to divide out of control or divide very, very fast. It'll produce a whole clone of cells that are identical to it, that are all dividing very, very fast. And then in that clone, one of those will undergo a further mutation that might even make it divide even faster. And gradually, through this process of accumulating mutations, you get more and more advanced clones that have stranger and stranger properties until eventually they get so strange properties that they then become cancer. They then start invading the surrounding tissue, destroying the surrounding tissue, and that's when we start to call the cancer, uh, the tumour rather, cancer. Okay, so a neuroendocrine tumour fundamentally is one that arose from a neuroendocrine cell. So the initial cell that started off the entire tumorigenesis process uh, was a neuroendocrine cell. So that's fantastic, as long as you know what a neuroendocrine cell is. So finally, to complete the explanation, let me tell you what a neuroendocrine cell is. So you can work this out just by looking at the name. Endocrine refers to hormones. So this is a cell that's going to release hormones. The neuro means that it's going to be under the control of neurons. So let me just draw a picture of my neuroendocrine cell here. So in blue, this can be my neuroendocrine cell. Here's its nice little nucleus here. And it's going to be a cell that releases some sort of hormone. And the control for the release of this hormone is going to come from the nervous system. So this is going to be the terminus of some sort of neuron here. Okay, and that's the way, um, well, that's what a neuroendocrine cell fundamentally is. It's a cell that releases a hormone and what dictates how much of that hormone it releases, it's under the control of the nervous system fundamentally. 
So to give you some examples of neuroendocrine cells, famous examples of neuroendocrine cells are the adrenal chromaffin cells, the cells right at the centre of the adrenal gland. And when we discussed long, long ago um, the adrenal gland structure, I told you that the adrenal medulla contains the adrenal chromaffin cells, which are the cells that release adrenaline. And they do so under the control of neurons. So adrenal chromaffin cells, the cells in the adrenal medulla which release adrenaline. These are an example of a neuroendocrine cell. In addition, the cells of the pituitary gland, they are neuroendocrine cells. They release all sorts of, uh, it's particularly the anterior pituitary, I should say, because remember the posterior pituitary is effectively just an extension of the hypothalamus, but the anterior pituitary cells, they are cells that secrete all sorts of different hormones and they do so under the control of the hypothalamus which consists of nerves so well neurons so the anterior pituitary gland cells as well these are all examples of neuroendocrine cells okay right so um, that's what a neuroendocrine cell is so we now understand what a neuroendocrine tumor is it's just a tumor that arises from neuroendocrine cells so all carcinoid tumors fundamentally are going to arise from neuroendocrine cells because they're all neuroendocrine tumors now what then is the special thing about carcinoid tumors that you know makes them special in this set of neuroendocrine tumors well this is the part where i'm not even going to pretend to understand it because you need to know quite a lot of embryology to understand what the definition of a carcinoid tumour actually is. A carcinoid tumour is a neuroendocrine tumour that specifically arises from neuroendocrine cells that all have the same embryological origin. They all come from a certain cell type in the embryo. And this cell type has a huge, great long name that I'm not going to give to you, um, because it won't mean anything to you unless you know a huge amount of embryology. But what you need to understand is that in the embryo, there is a certain type of cell, and I'm going to even draw a little picture. So here is this type of cell, and this type of cell gives rise to loads of different neuroendocrine cells. It does not give rise to all the neuroendocrine cells, however. So this is this type of cell, which I'll just call cell X, let's say. Okay, I've made that name up. That is not the official name of it. But this is some type of cell in the embryo. And this gives rise to a whole bunch of different types of neuroendocrine cells. And if you get a neuroendocrine tumour from a neuroendocrine cell that came from this cell X, then it's called a carcinoid tumour. However, there are loads of other neuroendocrine cells, and unfortunately, these famous ones, the adrenal chromaffin cell and the anterior pituitary gland cells, I don't think they do come from this type of cell X. So tumours of these regions are not referred to as carcinoid tumours. Okay, um, so there are other types of cell from the embryo that give rise to neuroendocrine cells. Um, so it's not, not all neuroendocrine cells are from this cell line, and therefore not all neuroendocrine tumours are going to be counted as carcinoid tumours. So that's the definition of carcinoid tumour. It's a subset of the neuroendocrine tumours where the neuroendocrine cell that gave rise to that tumour has come from this specific type of cell embryologically. And this has some proper name rather than cell X, but unless you know a huge amount of embryology, you're not going to uh, know what that cell is. Okay, right, so that is the definition of a carcinoid tumour. At least we have some sort of understanding now. They are neuroendocrine tumours, and the, fun, the um, thorough definition refers to the cell type that the neuroendocrine cell comes from embryologically. We now want to discuss this thing called um, the carcinoid syndrome, but actually let me firstly tell you about where carcinoid tumours generally arise. So most carcinoid tumours then are in the gastrointestinal tract, somewhere along the gastrointestinal tract. In fact, it's estimated that 90% of carcinoid tumours arise in neuroendocrine cells or arise from neuroendocrine cells in the gastrointestinal tract. So most carcinoid tumours are present within the gastrointestinal tract. So the gastrointestinal tract, or GIT for short, contains a lot of these neuroendocrine cells that come from this type of embryological cell that if you develop a tumour from that, we would then refer to it as a carcinoid tumour. So most of them 
are in the gastrointestinal tract. The other major place to be aware of uh, where carcinoid tumours can arise is in the lungs as well. So in the lungs you have some of these neuroendocrine cells that have arisen from this cell X in the embryo, uh, which if you get a tumour from that type of cell uh, will be called a carcinoid tumour. So those are the two major locations to be aware of where you can get these carcinoid tumours forming. Now let's go on then to the carcinoid syndrome. So of course this is cancer and cancer's horrible and it will have all the same normal horrible things that cancer does but these carcinoid tumours can do an added extra effectively from other forms of cancer which is because they are neuroendocrine tumours and because they have specifically arisen from this type of cell in the embryo they actually have a tendency to start chucking out a huge number of bioactive molecules so this is what makes these interesting as far as carcinoid heart disease and the carcinoid syndrome is concerned. These carcinoid tumours in many people, and not in all cases, but in many cases, they start producing a whole bunch of bioactive molecules. And this kind of makes sense. Remember that they are arising from a neuroendocrine cell. These cells secrete things into the blood and now that we've got a tumour of these cells, it kind of makes sense that it might start secreting loads of things into the blood, and carcinoid tumours are particularly bad for doing it. So what sort of bioactive molecules can they start producing? Well, one of them, and the one that's going to be extremely important for us, is 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin, and I'll just write out its full name. So 5-HT is the abbreviation, and it stands for 5 hydroxy tryptamine, the other name for which is serotonin. So this is serotonin, an extremely important signaling molecule, and a very small molecule as well. It's synthesized from a single amino acid, which is tryptophan. You take the carboxylic acid group off tryptophan, and then you add a hydroxyl group onto it, and then you've got serotonin, or you might do that in the opposite order, I'm sorry. Yes, you take tryptophan, you add the 5-hydroxy on to make 5-hydroxytryptophan, and then you take the carboxylic acid group off to make 5-hydroxytryptamine. But the point is it's synthesized from a single amino acid, so it's a very small little molecule. So 5-hydroxytryptamine is one of the bioactive molecules that can be released by carcinoid tumours, and it's going to be an important one. Uh, another one that I want you to be aware of is that they can release histamine. And finally, the other one that I'm going to say, because um, we're actually going to discuss its role in the carcinoid syndrome, is they can release the protein calocrine. Now histamine again is another tiny little molecule just like serotonin. It's synthesized from the amino acid histidine. Uh, again, you just take the carboxylic acid group off the amino acid and then you've got histamine. Calocrine, meanwhile, is not a small molecule. This is an enzyme. So this is a whole protein. Now, carcinoid tumours can secrete loads more bioactive molecules than just these three. These are the three that I'm actually going to talk about and which are involved in some of the major symptoms of the carcinoid syndrome. But if you go to a textbook, you can get a much longer list of molecules released by carcinoid tumours than just this. But these are three really important ones that you should know about. And I'm going to explain how these give rise to the symptoms of the carcinoid syndrome. So... If you have a carcinoid tumour, quite often these carcinoid tumours can do something very interesting. They do all the same things as cancer normally does, but they can also start chucking bioactive molecules into the blood, and this can give rise to the carcinoid syndrome. So you should not have all of these bioactive molecules just being chucked into the blood. They're going to trigger side effects, and the side effect um, syndrome that they cause is called the carcinoid syndrome. So we're now going to discuss this. Now, I should say one little thing, which is that usually you only get carcinoid syndrome after the carcinoid tumour has metastasized to the liver and caused significant damage to the liver. So remember, most carcinoid tumours are going to arise in the gastrointestinal tract, and I'm just going to draw a little picture here. So I'll draw a bit of the gastrointestinal tract. So here is the esophagus, here's the stomach, and here is a bit of the small intestine, and there's the 
three different areas of the small intestine, the duodenum, now we're in the jejunum, and then finally the ileum here, and then of course you're going to the cecum, I've missed off the appendix, but never mind, and then you're going to the large intestine, and it will come around here, the transverse colon, the descending colon, etc. And then, of course, the sigmoid colon and the rectum. Okay, here is the gastrointestinal tract, a picture of it. Remember, all of the blood coming back from the gastrointestinal tract, it firstly goes to the liver, which is drawn a bit out of scale here, but just to try and make the picture simpler, here we go. So all of the venous blood, which I'll draw in blue here, first goes back to the liver, and the liver takes any nasties out of there, uh, takes anything that might endanger the rest of the body that has been absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract out. It also takes a lot of the nutrients that has been absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract out as well. And then, after the blood's gone through the liver, then it goes back into the systemic venous system. So it will then go through the right heart, around the pulmonary circulation, into the left heart, and then it can go round again. Okay, now... When you initially have a carcinoid tumour somewhere in the gastrointestinal tract, which is where they usually are, uh, what will happen is if it is secreting these bioactive molecules, they'll all go to the liver firstly, and the liver will get rid of them. It will say these things should not be floating around in the blood at these high levels. Let's take them out. And that means that initially these don't cause a problem because the liver deals with it. Therefore, you only are actually going to get the carcinoid syndrome, the side effect of having all of these bioactive molecules chucked into the blood, once the liver has stopped doing that. And when will the liver stop doing that? Well, if the liver's damaged in some horrendous way, and the way that the carcinoid tumour can damage the liver is by metastasizing to it. So once uh, you've got significant metastases in the liver, and therefore liver function is hugely reduced, that's when the carcinoid tumour will actually start causing the carcinoid syndrome in most cases. Of course, that doesn't necessarily apply if we're talking about the lungs. Um, if, you know, you've got a carcinoid tumour in the lungs, then of course the um, bioactive molecules will go uh, to the left heart first and will trigger uh, carcinoid heart disease in the left heart. And uh, But of course, then you have to buy, bear in mind that even if the liver... Even though the blood won't go around to the liver for quite a while, it will still go around to the liver, so you will get some of these removed. So you'll get a milder form of carcinoid syndrome whilst the liver's still intact until you've had metastases go to the liver. And so what I'm overall trying to say here is that usually you only get carcinoid syndrome once you've got significant metastases to uh, the liver, especially if we're talking about a carcinoid tumour that's just in the gastrointestinal tract because all of the blood that comes back from the gastrointestinal tract is going to go through the liver firstly. So whilst the liver is still functioning, it will protect the body from the effects of these bioactive molecules. Okay, so let me now talk about some of the major symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. Now, we'll leave uh, carcinoid heart disease, which is part of carcinoid syndrome, right until the end. So we'll talk about the other ones first. So I'm going to talk about three other symptoms of carcinoid, heart, uh, of carcinoid syndrome. One of them is cutaneous flushing. So the skin goes red. Blood supply to the skin is hugely increased and your skin appears red and this is called cutaneous flushing. I'll explain why you get each of these in just a moment. Uh, another major symptom of carcinoid heart disease is that you're going to get bronchoconstriction. So the bronchi and the bronchioles start to constrict down and the airways narrow and you get something similar to an asthmatic attack. So bronchoconstriction occurs. And you might notice that I'm colour coding this in some interesting way. And then the final major symptom of carcinoid syndrome, apart from carcinoid heart disease, is that you get diarrhoea. Okay, and that's going to be because um, the muscle cells, the smooth muscle cells around the gastrointestinal tract start contracting more. So let's go through why you get each of these. So cutaneous flushing, and 
this, this of course, I've described, it involves the skin going red, blood supply to the skin going up hugely, and this occurs all over your body, so it doesn't just occur in your face, it occurs in your arms, your torso, it can even occur on your legs. So your skin all over your body goes red because you've got much more blood going to the skin, and this is called cutaneous flushing. So what causes the cutaneous flushing? Well, look at the way I've colour-coded it. It's going to be the result of the calocrine enzyme. So, for this I'd just like to give a bit of background into the calocrine kinin system because this makes complete sense if you understand the calocrine kinin system. So I'd like to explain what calocrine usually does, what actually is calocrine and its role. So this is called the calocrine kinin system and it's important as part of the inflammatory response. It's an important positive feedback system for maintaining inflammation. So, to discuss this, I'm just going to draw a little bit of the microvasculature. So we have to imagine we've got an area that is undergoing the inflammatory response, and we've talked about inflammation a huge amount in this video, so we should be used to the concept of inflammation. So let's imagine that we've got an area that is undergoing inflammation. Let's imagine that maybe there's a pathogen there, an infection there, and the inflammatory response is occurring to try and clear this infection. So I'm just now going to draw a few little vessels of the microvasculature. So remember, in any area of the body, there are microvasculature blood vessels, which consist of, firstly, a terminal arteriole, then the terminal arteriole will break up into smaller blood vessels, which are capillaries, like so. So I've shown it breaking up into three capillaries there, and then the capillaries reconverge into tiny little blood vessels called post-capillary venules. So these vessels that I'm showing here, these are micro, meaning small, and then vasculature referring to blood vessels, so microvasculature vessels here. And I've drawn three different types of vessel here. The capillaries, which of course are where gas exchange will occur here, and we've got three capillaries there, one, two, three. We might have much more in a single capillary bed here. Then where they've reconverged, this is a tiny little venule, and to emphasize the fact that this is a tiny little venule. This is the venule just after the capillaries have reconverged. We call this a post-capillary venule. So this word, venule, it's a bad word because it covers a huge scope of different sized blood vessels. You know, there are some venules that are only just smaller than veins, which are visible blood vessels. Um, whereas these venules that I'm talking about here, these are tiny, these are barely bigger than capillaries. These are a few cells thick, okay? Um, you'd be able to fit a few red blood cells maybe across the diameter of this. So these are tiny little blood vessels. So to emphasize that fact, we put the post capillary there and they're part of the microvasculature, of course. And then over at the front, we've got the terminal arteriole. And again, um, arteriole is a bad word because it covers a huge scope of different sized blood vessels. It covers vessels that are just smaller than arteries, which are visible, and all the way down to these tiny little arterioles, which again are only a few red blood cells thick in diameter, which are the terminal arterioles. So we put the terminal there to illustrate, to emphasize the fact that these are the arterioles just prior to where we get capillaries branching off, so the last arteriole. So this is just a reminder of the microvasculature. So in all tissues in the body you have microvasculature like this. And remember the terminal arterioles, they have vascular smooth muscle cells around them, which for short I'll abbreviate down to VSMCs, vascular smooth muscle cells. They have vascular smooth muscle cells around their outside, and these vascular smooth muscle cells can contract and relax and control the diameter of this blood vessel. And this is the way that you control the amount of blood flowing through this little bit of tissue here by controlling the diameter of the terminal arteriole. Okay, so there's a little bit of information about the microvasculature, and it's really important to understand that just to go over inflammation. So, the inflammatory response then involves three things, two of them we've talked about at length earlier on in the video. 
but the first one I don't think we actually have emphasised previously, so that's why I just wanted to draw this picture of the microvasculature. So one of them, the first one, is that you're going to get vasodilatation. So again, I'll put the motivation here. Imagine we've got an infection in this tissue here. We want to clear that infection. We have to bring in troops. The troops are all in the blood. The inflammatory response is the response of the microvasculature to try and help you bring in troops to this infected area. So you're going to get vasodilation of the terminal arterioles, which will increase the amount of blood flowing through this microvasculature and therefore increase the number of troops that we can recruit from the blood into the area. So vasodilatation by relaxing the vascular smooth muscle cells, you're going to get endothelial cell contraction and this will occur in both the capillaries and the postcapillary venules because both of those have really simple structures of their walls. Their walls literally just consist of an endothelial cell sat on a basement membrane. So you get endothelial cell contraction not just in the capillaries but also in the postcapillary venules. Um, so effectively postcapillary venules are just like bigger versions of capillaries. Their wall structure is just as thin so they can participate in um, producing an exudate and recruiting leukocytes just like capillaries can. So you'll get endothelial cell contraction and also the final one of course leukocyte recruitment and I'll just remind you of the motivation for endothelial cell contraction. The idea is we are bringing in proteins from the blood which can attack pathogens. Leukocyte recruitment of course we're bringing in white blood cells that can attack pathogens. So those are the three major components of inflammation and remember vasodilation when you get more blood flowing from an area that will make the area redder Endothelial cell contraction and leukocyte recruitment will make the area swell, um, so you'll get a swelling around there. Vasodilation will also make the area hot, so this is why inflamed areas swell, they appear red, and they are hot to the touch, because that's what the inflammatory response does. Okay, you'll also get pain in the area, but that can't be explained by any of these. That is explained by the inflammatory mediators that mediate these also activating pain neurons nearby. Okay, so that is a reminder of the inflammatory response. Now let's discuss the calocrine kinin system, which is a system to positively reinforce the inflammatory response. So let me tell you about the key players in the calocrine kinin system. And they're all floating around in the blood in inactive forms. There are three proteins that are going to be extremely important here. The first is called Hageman factor. Now Hageman factor has another name. It's also called coagulation factor 12. So it's a really important factor in the coagulation cascades, specifically in the intrinsic coagulation cascade. I don't think it's involved in the extrinsic coagulation cascade. Yes, I think it isn't involved in extrinsic. It's in the intrinsic coagulation cascade, the first protein in the intrinsic coagulation cascade. But it's also involved in the calocrine kinin system. So Hageman factor is one. The other one that's really important in the calocrine kinin system is pre-calocrine, which is going to become calocrine. And remember, we're at the moment talking about the function of calocrine physiologically rather than the function of it in the carcinoid syndrome. We'll come to that. I just firstly want to make sure everyone knows what calocrine is and what it normally is involved in doing. Uh, and then finally, one called high molecular weight, which I'll abbreviate to HMW, kininogen. So this is high molecular weight, kin ooh, spelt that wrong. Kininogen. Like so. So high molecular weight kininogen, which for short we can abbreviate down even shorter to HMWK, like so. So these are three proteins that are circulating in the blood and they're the key proteins of the calocrine kinin system and they're all produced by the liver and put into the blood. Now, when endothelial cell contraction occurs in the capillaries and the postcapillary venules at this site which is undergoing inflammation, all three of these proteins will now leave the bloodstream and when they leave the bloodstream, they will then be allowed to see all sorts of molecules that they would never be allowed to see and that's what activates the calocrine kinin system. They suddenly begin the activation process and the process begins with Hageman factor, factor 12. So, 
let me just uh, draw a little bit of this. So they're going to come out because the endothelial cells have contracted and we know that lots of proteins in the um, blood plasma can now leave the blood, well, can leave the vessels and go into the interstitial fluid to produce this exudate. And we know that one of the key types of proteins we bring in is the complement proteins. We're also going to bring in these proteins of the calocrine kinin system. So Hageman factor comes in and this can represent Hageman factor and it begins the entire thing off. So this is factor 12 coming in here. So factor 12 will be activated to factor 12A when it meets collagen. When it binds to collagen, it will be activated. Now, normally it is never, ever allowed to see collagen because collagen should never be exposed to the inside of a blood vessel. So factor 12 is usually circulating around the bloodstream and all it sees is the boring apical surfaces of the endothelial cells. It never gets to see collagen. That's why the vegetation is formed when you lost the endothelial cells on the surface of the heart valves because suddenly they were allowed to see collagen and that kick-started the intrinsic coagulation cascade. Here, we're bringing factor 12 out into the interstitial fluid and now what's it going to see? Loads and loads of collagen in the extracellular matrix, in the spider's web of proteins amongst cells, which is the extracellular matrix, there is loads of collagen. So factor 12 is going to get uh, activated to factor 12A by collagen. So this activation process occurs in response to collagen. Then um, factor 12A is going to activate precalocrine, which has also come out of the bloodstream, to calocrine. So let me just show this now. So this can represent precalocrine, which has come out of the bloodstream, and now it's going to be activated to the active protein, the active enzyme which is calocrine by factor 12A. So this is the pre-calocrine, and I'll just try and label it up. So this is pre-calocrine, and then the one it's being turned into is, of course, calocrine. And it's being converted into calocrine by the factor 12A. So just to summarise where we've got to so far, when factor 12 comes out of the blood into the interstitial fluid, it comes into contact with collagen and is instantly activated to factor 12A. It then converts precalocrine, which is inactive and has also come out of the bloodstream where it was previously circulating, into the enzyme calocrine. And now calocrine is going to act on the high molecular weight caninogen and break it down to produce um, bradykinin. So I'll draw this down here. So let's have the high molecular weight kininogen represented here, and it has again come into the interstitial fluid. So here is the high molecular weight kininogen, and now what's going to happen is this is going to be chopped up, and one of the tiny little products that you're going to get from this is a little molecule called bradykinin, and this now is really important. So this is bradykinin. And this was produced by our calocrine here. Okay, so the overall result of all of these three proteins, Hageman factor, pre-calocrine, and high molecular weight caninogen coming out of the bloodstream is that we've produced bradykinin from high molecular weight caninogen. And bradykinin is now going to help in positively feeding back on the inflammatory response. So it now goes and binds to a receptor on the endothelial cells on the capillaries, the post-capillary venules, and the terminal arterioles, and then triggers all of these three responses of inflammation. So this is through the B2 receptor, the bradykinin 2 receptor. Do not confuse that with the beta 2 receptor, because I've managed to make the B look too much like a Beta, so I'll rewrite it out there. So this is the bradykinin 2 receptor. So this is a G protein coupled receptor that will be on the surface of the endothelial cells. So if this is the phospholipid bilayer of cell membrane, it will have the classic G protein coupled receptor structure with seven membrane spanning alpha helices. And bradykinin will bind to this 
activate the receptor and activate an intracellular signaling pathway in the endothelial cells that will lead to them uh, doing their respective job. So if we're talking about an endothelial cell in the terminal arterial here, or indeed an endothelial cell in the capillaries or the postcapillary venules, then one of the things that will happen is you will get the production of prostaglandin I2, which will go off and cause uh, smooth muscle cell relaxation. So one of the things that bradykinin produces is it gets the endothelial cells to produce prostaglandin I2, PGI2, also called prostacyclin, and this is the way that you get vasodilatation. So the way that terminal arterioles vasodilatate in the inflammatory response is by the endothelial cells being activated to undergo the inflammatory response and producing prostacyclin, PGI2, as a result. And this goes back to the vascular smooth muscle cells and tells them to relax. So endothelial cells in the terminal arterial, the capillaries, and the postcapillary venules, they'll all produce prostacyclin. So prostacyclin will go up in this area here and it will cause uh, the terminal arteriole to relax. And indeed, bradykinin is incredibly powerful at producing vasodilatation in blood vessels. The activation of the B2 receptor on the endothelial cells in the capillaries and the postcapillary venules will also activate endothelial cell contraction and leukocyte recruitment as well. So bradykinin is incredibly good at positively feeding back the inflammatory response. So this entire system, and let me get the pen, this entire system, the calocrine kinin system, is all about positive feedback. It's all about the inflammatory response maintaining itself. Inflammation producing more inflammation, producing more inflammation. So that's what this is all about. It's about increasing the amount of inflammation. It's about inflammation causing inflammation, maintaining the inflammatory response. So I hope you understand the role that this normally plays in strengthening the inflammatory response. Right, so now we can understand why a carcinoid tumour releasing calocrine into the blood is going to lead to cutaneous flushing. If you release active calocrine into the blood, then that will start working on the high molecular weight caninogen in the blood, converting it to bradykinin, or chopping it up and producing a little segment, which is bradykinin, which will act on B2 receptors in the microvasculature all over the body, but particularly in the skin, and that's going to cause vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles via the production of prostacyclin, which will then cause vascular smooth muscle cell relaxation of the terminal arterioles. And therefore you'll get more blood flowing to the skin everywhere, and this is why you get cutaneous flushing in the carcinoid syndrome. Okay, so that was the most lengthy explanation, so that's because that one's the one that you might not have heard of before. Calocrine causes cutaneous flushing. Histamine, there are histamine receptors on the bronchial smooth muscle cells. So around the bronchi and the bronchioles, you have smooth muscle cells which control the uh, diameter of the bronchi and bronchioles. Histamine can cause those smooth muscle cells to contract. They have histamine receptors on the surface um, and therefore you'll get bronchoconstriction which will make it much more difficult to breathe it's just like an asthmatic attack that's exactly what happens in an asthmatic attack you get bronchoconstriction okay so finally then diarrhea why do you get that it's because serotonin activates the smooth muscle cells in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract causes them to contract and therefore you get increased peristalsis and that's why you get diarrhea because the food boluses move through uh, too quickly and therefore don't get digested properly and that's what causes diarrhea. Okay so those are the major um, symptoms of carcinoid syndrome and those are the bioactive molecules responsible. Now let's talk about what we're really interested in which is carcinoid heart disease. So a consequence of carcinoid syndrome is carcinoid heart disease, and this is not actually a rare consequence at all. It's about estimated that in about 50% of people with carcinoid syndrome, you will get carcinoid heart disease. And the one that's believed to be responsible for the carcinoid heart disease is believed to be the serotonin. Above all the other bioactive molecules that the carcinoid tumour releases, 
it's believed to be the serotonin that's going to cause the carcinoid heart disease. And normally the part of the heart that's affected by carcinoid heart disease is the right heart. And the reason is that that's the side of the heart where the bioactive molecules are going to come to first. Because remember, usually the carcinoid tumour is in the gastrointestinal tract. The blood will go back into the systemic venous system after it's gone through the liver, which is broken because of the metastases. Uh, and therefore it's going to go to the right heart first, so that will get the stronger dose. And then it will have to go through the entire pulmonary circulation before it gets to the left side of the heart. And indeed, the pulmonary circulation has ways of breaking down bioactive molecules as well. So often the right heart is the one that's affected in carcinoid heart disease, and therefore the right heart valves are going to be affected. Uh, if, of course, it arises in the lungs, then it's far more likely that the left heart's going to be involved rather than the right heart. But normally, carcinoid tumours are in the gastrointestinal tract. So what happens then in carcinoid heart disease? Well, you get both the endocardium uh, lining the wall of the heart muscle affected and also the heart valves affected. And for reasons that are not particularly understood, serotonin high concentration of serotonin running through the heart produces this characteristic thickening of the connective tissue in the endocardium and also in the heart valve cusps. So remember the endocardium consists of the endothelium along with that connective tissue layer underneath before you get to the myocardium. The heart valve cusps they consist of connective tissue underneath the endothelium. So Either the connective tissue underneath the endothelium in the endocardium is going to be thickened, or the connective tissue in the heart valve cusps is going to be thickened, and usually it's both of them at the same time, I should stress. But those are the two areas that are affected by the carcinoid heart disease. Now what happens, you get a huge, huge amount of mucose polysaccharides produced. So the huge amount of serotonin running through the right heart, and I think I will just draw a little picture, a simple picture of the heart. So this is a really simple picture of the heart. So here's the heart, and this is dividing it up into the four chambers, fairly simply. So this is the right atrium and this is the right ventricle. So the huge amount of serotonin running through the right atrium and the right ventricle is going to trigger changes in the endocardium of these chambers and also the heart valve cusps and uh, specifically the tricuspid heart valve cusps and of course the pulmonary heart valve cusps uh, and this involves a huge amount of mucopolysaccharides which remember is the old name for the glycosaminoglycans uh, being deposited in those connective tissue layers. So the endocardium gets much much thicker and that connective tissue layer is the bit that's getting thicker and you get a huge amount of mucopolysaccharides deposited there. So if I just draw a picture of this, let's say these are the endothelial cells here, and then I'll put the basement membrane on as always in a thicker pen. So here's the basement membrane. And then underneath you have that connective tissue layer of the endocardium which is here, and then usually this will be the end of it, and then you start the myocardium. What's now going to happen is you're going to get a huge amount of mucopolysaccharides deposited in here, and it's going to become much, much thicker, much thicker. So it might now engorge to, let's say, this size here. So it's now going to become this thick instead. And of course, this will be expanding into the chamber of the heart because it can't expand into the myocardium, so it has to expand inwards. So the endocardium gets much, much thicker, and all of this mucopolysaccharide connective tissue that's been deposited, this gives the inside of the wall of the heart a glistening white appearance. So if you're looking at the inside of the heart, let's imagine we are a little man standing in the right ventricle that has undergone carcinoid heart disease. It looks a glistening white colour which is very abnormal, it shouldn't usually look a glistening white colour. And what you're seeing is all of this mucopolysaccharide connective tissue that's now deposited uh, in the endocardium. This also happens in the heart valve cusps, so the heart valve cusps become much, much thicker. So drawing a heart valve cusp, let's say this is just a heart valve cusp, it might now become like this, just to get the message across really crudely, um, because you've 
put down a huge amount of more mucopolysaccharides, and these aren't just reserved to the spongiosa there. Remember, usually you have lots of mucopolysaccharides in the spongiosa. Throughout the heart valve cusp, you're going to get a huge amount of these mucopolysaccharides deposited in carcinoid heart disease, and that's what happens. So usually the right heart is affected much more than the left heart. So what are the consequences of this for the heart valve? the heart valves, the right-sided heart valves, the tricuspid and the pulmonary valve, well, their cusps are going to become much, much thicker. But remember, this mucopolysaccharide, it's more sort of a rubbery connective tissue than a rigid connective tissue. So this can actually result in two things. It can result in both stenosis and regurgitation. And this is a really important point, that heart valves, they aren't just necessarily stenosed or regurgitating, they can have both of those. So a heart valve can both not open widely enough and not close properly. And actually this massive thickening of the heart valve cusps that you get in carcinoid heart disease, it's firstly going to mean that they don't open properly, but it actually also means that they don't close properly because they can't nicely fit together anymore. So you end up with gaps still between the heart valve cusps. So it actually usually leads to both stenosis and regurgitation together, or just one of them. So it can lead to stenosis, regurgitation, or both of them at the same time. And that's of both the tricuspid and the pulmonary valve. So stenosis and regurgitation of the tricuspid and pulmonary valves. Of course, this is if we're talking about a um, carcinoid tumour that is in the gastrointestinal tract. If we're talking about a carcinoid tumour that's in the lungs, then it will be the mitral and the aortic valve as usual. But I promised you that we would look at a pathological process that more commonly affects the right-sided heart valves, and here it actually is. So that's all I can really say about carcinoid heart disease, because we don't understand why the serotonin actually leads to this, but it does. And we do think that it is specifically the serotonin that actually is the major one of the bioactive molecules released. So let me now summarise carcinoid heart disease. So it starts with a carcinoid tumour which is usually present in the gastrointestinal tract. Once you've got significant liver impairment because of liver metastases usually, um, the bioactive molecules secreted by the carcinoid tumour, or often secreted by carcinoid tumours, will now actually go up and up in the bloodstream. Three of the major ones to know about are 5-hydroxytryptamine, histamine and calocrine. These lead to the carcinoid syndrome and some of the major symptoms of the carcinoid syndrome are cutaneous flushing all over the body and that's due to the calocrine producing bradykinin all over the body and producing major vasodilatation everywhere. Uh, bronchoconstriction because the histamine activates bronchial smooth muscle cells around the airways causing them to constrict and effectively you get the same thing that you would get in an asthmatic attack, really difficult to breathe, shortness of breath, feeling as though you're going to drown um, and then you get diarrhea because the serotonin activates the smooth muscle cells in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract causing the smooth, well causing um, the contents to move through much quicker and not be digested properly and therefore you get diarrhea. Finally, of course, the one that we're really interested in is carcinoid heart disease, and this is believed to be because of the serotonin. Normally, it affects the right side of the heart because that's where the blood is going to go through first, and what happens is you get massive thickening of the endocardium and also the heart valve cusps, and it's the mucopolysaccharides that are being laid down. This results in glistening white appearance of the heart valve cusps and the inside wall of the heart and it can result in both stenosis and regurgitation of the uh, tricuspid and the pulmonary valve, uh, or both of them together. Right, so that completes our discussion of the pathological processes that can lead to valvular heart disease. Uh, in the next video, we will discuss prosthetic heart valves, which are a way of replacing diseased heart valves uh, with a prosthetic one.